Good. from New Orleans and my uh, studio in the sky for the second go round of the my meeting of the minds and uh, very honored tonight to have uh, the women of golf instruction not all we'll have some more on in other shows I've got a list already but this is a great group of diverse intelligent smart ladies and uh, we're going to we're going to learn a lot from each other and uh, hopefully entertain all the folks that are watching probably in a few countries all over the world and you know tonight uh, on uh, Facebook and uh, on Twitter so as i told the ladies a second ago this is how this works we've got four categories of questions golf swing mechanics and performance golf instruction business, golf instruction history, and uh, golf science and technology. No, it's not like Jeopardy, but it sounds like it, right? <laughs> I'll take golf instruction history for 200. And uh, I'll ask a, each question to a different women uh, golf professional. They'll be the first to answer. Other folks will weigh in, and we'll just start the way it's lined up right here with uh, Dr. Allison. Good to have you on. And uh, so here we go. Mechanics question right off the bat. Very popular right now to have this look at the top of the swing where the left arm's kind of low, the right arm's a little under, and the club's a little on the laid off side. And then of course, there have been a lot of great players. More of a Nicholas look. Clubs more between the arms. Right arms a little higher and a little bit more on top. Uh, to me, the current, you know, style, just like uh, these skinny pants I got on, are to have it a little more under and a little more laid off. What, what do you What do you think about that that trend first as a trend, and and what is if, if any, what is your preference on that, Allison? Yeah, it's a good question. I even brought my little club, so we can kind of we can kind of talk that right. too. Um, I definitely think that there is a trend. I wouldn't say it's a fad, but certainly a trend that um, a lot of players are trying to get that lead wrist into flexion at the top and and getting that look of kind of the club face, um, almost appearing like slightly closed, if you will when you get to the top and, and I'm a more of a teacher that is in, in terms of the LPGA model student centered. So depending on how someone's body is built, do they have a preference for more of a strong grip preference for more of a weak grip? I think that's really going to influence what the club face does at the top and what that lead wrist is looking at the top. Now, certainly if I have a player that's like really cupped and they're coming down with an open face and then flipping it at the bottom, then I'm going to start looking at their grip type and how they're placing their hands on the golf club and then seeing if we can maybe get to a place that allows a playable ball flight. Um, me personally, I don't care what it looks like at the top, if it's more flex, if it's more extended. I want the golfer to be able to hit a shot and expect where it's going and have it end up where it's going. Um, so the playable ball flight to me is the most important. So again, just going to grip type, how their body is built, and then seeing what best works for them and how they can repeat that. Cool. Any, anybody got anything to add there? Sure, Cheryl. Well, if in you order. Think of the greatest woman golfer of all time. It's got to be Annika Sorenstam, right? And Absolutely. She played, that, she played with that cuffed left wrist, and I can also think of uh, Lorena Ochoa. So, like Allison said, it's got to be player centered. Whatever, whatever squares the face up, right? Absolutely. Uh, anybody else on that one? Krista? Chris, Krista Dutton down at the bottom. <laughs> There's Susan. So, okay, Chris, open there. You know, I, I think it depends on body shape and build. So I think it depends on wingspan and length of lower arm versus upper arm. You know, where the, a player naturally wants to go, how their arms fold and where that puts them at the top. I also think it depends, does, does a person visualize and see golf 
in more of an up and down where the arms are working more of an up and down choppier motion and the body's turning flatter or do they visualize golf almost as a tilted baseball swing do they see things more rounded so a lot of it like you know these other two you know two other friends have said that kind of depends on really the individual how they see golf being played and what basically fits them as a player i really don't like putting people into a certain mold I think everyone has kind of a natural position they're going to fall into based a lot of based on thickness of chest, arm length, height, wingspan, and upper arm versus lower arm. Cool. All right, let's let's uh, let's jump to the next question. So, uh, Cheryl, hello, Cheryl. Um, best business decision you ever made as a golf teacher. Best best decision you ever made. Whoa. That's got to be moving 1,200 miles from home to go. I took a big chance to go work for uh, Mike Bender, and it turned out to be the best decision I could have ever made. So I'm very thankful. What 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 were you doing before you you went down to Florida to work with Mike? Well, I worked for 17 years in the Metropolitan section at uh, three very good clubs, and I one of the reasons I moved down, I I had my little girl, and I. Sandy LeBove gave me some great information. She said, Cheryl, if you ever have children, you need to go south. So you have the summers off. So it just kind of all worked out. And it works out great because now the summertime, I could spend a lot of my time with Callie. That's great. And, and, and of course, I, I'd have to agree. It was, it was a good move. Anybody else got a, a, a really good decision that they made? Maybe it wasn't easy when you made it uh, business-wise to maybe, maybe focus on a, a different part of uh, Kelly Stenzel and then Karen. Yeah, I think I have a similar story. I was teaching at a private club in Jupiter, Florida, and I was busy. I mean, I was booked, but I really had stopped learning. So I decided it was time to move on. And I went to work for Mike Adams at PGA National and I took a pay cut and I, we worked crazy hours, but it literally was like going to, you know, a doctorate degree and learning instruction. So it was scary and, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made because it was, we learned so much from Mike. It was amazing. Uh, as a follow up here, I want to ask uh, Lynn, Lynn and, and P, uh, either one of y'all, y'all can answer this. Did y'all do traditional, you know, cranking it out on the range, you know, our lessons before you, you, you developed what, what the business that you now have with Vision 54? Yeah, I mean, my, my start was I was totally a technical instructor. And uh, yeah, lesson book was filled with 30 minute lessons. And then I said, okay, go to 45 minute lessons. And then it was still full and I was still exhausted at night. <laughs> and I said, go to all the lessons, you know, just like, you know, trying to figure out the whole time product of it. But very much I was a technical teacher for the first like 15 years of, of doing, being a golf professional. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I would say too, for me, because I came from being a tour player and then started coaching. So I realized early on, I have all these players with all these swing teachers. So I spent many years educating myself in all the different swing models. And I said, I need to have a great understanding, but of course, coming from being a player and then uh, starting coaching players, I, you know, I realized I want to focus more on what actually happens when you play golf. I mean, if we're golf coaches, we're here to coach players playing golf. So I just went in with that mindset and, and realized uh, that, you know, there's a gap for many here that is awesome. We need to learn the swing, but it's of no use if I can't play better. So for me, that became very fascinating. And then Lynn obviously was interested in that too. So I think from the earlier question, it, it took for us a lot of courage to just dare to do what we truly believed in, even though many told us early on it's never going to work because we didn't do the traditional, the technical teaching only. Great. Karen, you had a, um, you had a follow-up, right? Didn't you? Yes, and it's actually, um, you know, you were talking about the best business decision ever, and this just happened recently. So I, uh, last year I um, started my cardio golf online, and, um, you know, some people kind of made fun of it, golf instruction inside with the shorty practice training club. Well, um, you know, six months later, we get hit with this crisis and everyone's at home. And um, I can't even keep up with the orders, people wanting to get my shorty club and the videos practicing at home. So, you know, just having that online 
six months ago has really helped me push me over this little um, lull that we're having in work. And, and it's been great because people are now practicing at home and, and practicing indoors could be a better way to improve your swing because you're not so worried about where the ball, ball's going. There's no judgment. You can work on the positions. You can actually work on some fitness and other things at the same time that are going to help you later on in the course. So just by packaging my cardio golf program last year has, has really helped me. I think when I, when I've not only the answers I just got from you folks, but the ones I got last week, the one thing that I'd like to communicate just to step out of my moderator role for a second to the young teachers is don't be afraid to move. You know, there's a big world out there. And if somebody offers you a, a, a position or, 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 or an opportunity, sometimes uh, it'll work out great. So let's go to our next question with Carol. Carol, great to have you on. Always great to see you. What golf teacher or mentor who's not with us anymore on this planet was your biggest influence? Oh, I'd have to, I'd have to say my father. He was, a, he was a PGA professional, wasn't he? He was. He was a, um, a half-century member, um, and he passed away last December at 94. Um, and probably along with my dad, Dr. Dee Dee Owens. I have, to, I have to say I hosted a swing model workshop in Marietta, back in the late, <clears throat> you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I think I got up on the first day, I think I got up the earliest I had ever woken up in my life to get there to impress Dee Dee and have everything set up and all the manuals laid out in the old Marietta Country Club clubhouse. And darn it, if I didn't pull in and there she was standing up there on the awning and the sun hadn't even come up yet. And it just made me realize, you know, you got to work your butt off. And, and that's just, that's one part of it. But she was, she was such a great woman and she had brilliance and she contributed so much to the LPGA. And I'm sure she's um, a mentor to so many, she was a mentor to so many people, but you know, my dad definitely um, influenced me and, I think those of you that have had a mother or a father in the business know how hard it is. <laughs> um, I almost anything I did wasn't good enough for him, but I understand why he wanted me to do better. He didn't want me to settle for mediocre. And he also um, wanted me to play the tour, which I never did. Um, but I think he was okay with where I ended up. <laughs> I, I, bet, I bet he was. I bet he was. Anybody got another uh, uh, mentor not not around anymore that you'd like to share with everybody? Uh, Pia? Yeah, I was very blessed to get many lessons from Manuel de la Torre, and uh, that's been with me forever. And uh, and also, I, I got to have get some lessons from his father, Angel de la Torre. And uh, the learnings from that has, has stayed with me from my own game and for lots lots of my students. Great. Any, any others? Okay, Christina. So, please correct me if I, uh, I've got this wrong. Next question. So, uh, when I was reading up on you, you started playing, and within either three or five years, you were a five handicapper. What, give me the right timeline there. Five. Five years. Five years, five handicapper. From scratch. Okay. So from, from, uh, from a new golfer. From a new golfer. That's that's awesome. So it's a it's a science and technology question. So the question basically it would be to move it into uh, you know pertinent to that experience, which I think is is unbelievably uh, important for a teacher, right? Because you have there's a lot of people that like to, that would like to duplicate that, that that come to see you and come to see all of us. So, was there any piece of technology that helped you go from beginner to five handicap in in uh, you know five years and 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 now you know are one of the top mm -hmm. teachers? 
That's a great question. And I have to say the answer to that was not technology for me. <laughs> Matter of fact, the two people that really helped me are sitting right here on this panel, <laughs> Pia and Lynn. Thank you very much. I was an eight handicap. Christina, at what point in, the, in that five years did you go see him? I was an eight. And someone said, hey, you got to go get their book. So I went and got their book. And then about three weeks later, I was on a plane. <laughs> went out to Arizona to see them. And a few months later, I was a five. So it's a lot of it for me was, was up here. So and, thank and, you guys very much significant As influence. I really appreciate lot, that. It's made me a, a better coach. Great, a lot of great Vision 54 stories. One one other question on that development. What what one thing early on got you was it the, the, the ability to hit the ball better right away or to or to get around the golf course one time, you know, and not hold anybody up? What what kept you going early on? I just love the challenge. I just love strike. I love striking the ball. It was love at first strike. To <laughs> be honest, it was. I think, that, I think that gets a lot of us. So just sticking on that technology, does anybody have some piece of tech or piece of science it could even be that uh, you feel like in the last couple of years has uh, altered your uh, teaching for the better, Trillium and then Allison? Definitely. I have a whole slew of stuff, so I'll keep it to a minute. But when I was down with Jim McLean at Doral, he had two track men. One was on one side, and one was on the other with the club fitters. And I spent a lot of time with those club fitters, just looking at ball flight, looking at numbers, looking at ball flight, looking at numbers. And then I, then the player would leave and I'd go hit some shots. And so I think that was an invaluable, invaluable part of my understanding of ball flight because I had some intuition about things, but then when I could actually look at things, look at swing direct, what's the difference between swing direction and club path? You know, the really dynamic loft, what's that? So what's spin, what, what does the spin do, you know, when you go into those higher loft shots? Like pretty basic stuff, but I think it made me so much better um, looking at ball flight without it, because then I had a real concrete understanding of the physics. And for me, that was just totally invaluable because what happens through impact is, in my opinion, um, you know, that that's the most influential and you, and there's not a whole lot of preference. I mean, yeah, you can hit fades, you can hit draws, you can have a high, low, whatever there's preference there, but you can't really argue with numbers too much when it comes down to those impact conditions. So that, that to me was really, really invaluable. And then, I mean, I could go on to the pressure plates and force plates and, and 3d, but I think I'll start with that. Hey Chris, we can can you check uh, to make sure we're on postmodern? I'm getting a couple of uh, a little uh, notes that maybe maybe we're not up on postmodern. I think every place else though. Um, okay, so let's uh, Dana. Not Dana. Okay, so we go to the next question. Great to great to see you, Dana, <laughs> and the puppy. So. Uh, I remember the first three people I ever met that said I went to Dana Rader. All had one, they all had two things in common. They were all guys and they were all good players. So you've worked with plenty of good players over the years, both both male and female. What um, do you see as the biggest mechanical flaw of the of the really good player? Um, that's a great question. Um, for me, uh, in working with better players, so when I was in Charlotte, I had a lot of lower handicap players. And the, the biggest flaw I saw in golfers was the transition. Uh, so they had a harder time going from a horizontal rotation, the, the horizontal plane, to the rotational, to, to, to the actual vertical. And that's the sequence of motion. So I work a lot with the lower handicap player with their sequencing because that's what most good players work on uh, is their balance, is their sequencing. And um, I really worked on how to, to start the downswing and how to really impact that where they, 
they had a lot of good success with that. So I had a lot of fun with, with working with lower handicapped players in Charlotte. Awesome. Anybody else want to weigh in on uh, the, the flaw they see, Krista, or with, with better players? I, you know, <clears throat> I think so many people have been overtaught on slicing. I think the hook is the, is the harder one for people to wrap their head around, especially for, for good players. You know, for a slice, everyone, you know, they understand they've got to swing more out to the right, but they have the hook, the hookers, and the better players have such a harder time conceptualizing some of the swing direction, the path that they need to get everything going more left and the ball's going that direction to override some of the, the direction with the face and the, what the path is doing. So I think that the better player to me, I see struggling a little more with, with the hook and the club head tends to drop under the plane a little too much or their hands get too high and they just start swinging things out to the right too much and they don't want to get things shifted over. The same way the slicer does, it's just a little different uh, in the hooker's mindset. I know I've been down that road and uh, it's a hard one to fix, but once you get there, you at least you understand that it. it's just different, different direction. No doubt about it. Anybody else on that? Sarah Stone What's with up, a PXG hat on, product <laughs> placement. Uh, you like that? PXG. I like it. I would say like I've had the extreme fortune to be around some good players down at Bears Club. And the one thing that I've noticed with really good players is they're chasing a look or a concept or a ball shape that, that they maybe can or cannot do, and then they fight it. And so I see a lot of the coaches working with them to change a concept or an understanding of how they're able to do it, or if they're not able to look like the favorite player that they want to look like. I, 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 certainly, I certainly have to agree with that one, absolutely. Okay, let's go to the next question, and Karen. Um, this was a question we asked the other, a couple of these are, we asked the other night. Hey, the, the heck with those guys, right? This is, we get the right answers here. Um, if there was one thing that you could go back career-wise and do differently, what would it be? Yes, that's a great question. I would actually go back and work more on my own game. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time watching and, um, and learning, but um, I would have taken more lessons and worked more on my own game just because I still play now and I would, you know, like to be a better player and I still work on my own game. But um, I think that's really important as a coach, as a teacher, to be a good player. And um, a lot of these ladies on here, I've played a lot of golf with. And, um, you know, we can all play pretty good and under pressure, you know, if we have a little bit of a swing flaw, it can kind of go south. So I think um, I would have gone back and really worked on my own game. That would have made me a better teacher. Not that, um, you know, I still work on my game right now. You know, Brian, you've been helping me with my swing, but I think that's really important. And as um, it's really interesting, um, I teach a lot uh, of the, the new teachers, the, the teacher training, and a lot of the new teachers are really focusing on playing more as opposed to just studying the swing and, and teaching a certain method. So I think um, playing more is really important as a golf coach. Anybody got it, anything else they'd like to do in a time machine for career-wise? <laughs> Allison? Yeah, I think earlier on, I would have enjoyed going to watch um, better teachers teach, especially locally in my area. I think when I first moved to Southern California, I was a bit naive about um, who was in this hot spot of teachers. And I think I've also would have sought out to find um, a strong female mentor to me. I would have really appreciated to have that in my life. And um, so if I would have go back, I would find those people really early on, right out of college, so that I'd have some, some great guidance to um, start, start to cultivate my career. Absolutely. Uh, anybody got anything else on that one? Okay. So next up, Kelly. Next up, Kelly. Okay. Um, what's the, what's the best book, two, two part question, the best golf book about improving golf that you've ever read and what book would you recommend a brand new golfer that sitting inside right now, maybe they're in one of the States, they haven't turned on golf. They go, you know what I'm going to do? I've been sitting around here. I live on a golf course. I've never played. I want to learn to play. I want to buy a book. But I want, to, I want to hear your best overall book first. So go ahead. Uh, you know, best overall book? I, I was always a big fan of Ernest Jones' Swing the Clubhead for some reason. You know, that's kind of an oldie but a goodie. 
And I, I just feel like that just carries so much weight to everybody playing golf. You know, it's, it was just such a good message. And I felt like even though it was written obviously a long time ago, that it really is very current today. As far as a book that I would recommend for somebody, you know, picking up golf, you know, I tend to go back to a lot of my Mike Adams background, which one of the books that he originally wrote was The Laws of Golf, which stand for the three body types, leverage, arc, and width being the models that match the body types. And those were kind of three basic swing models that would allow any golfer to really build a swing around the way they're built. Because what happens to a lot of golfers, in my opinion, is they try to swing the club other than their body allows, and then they get into trouble. So that's kind of a nice place, even though it's a little bit of an older book that I think if somebody hasn't played, at least they're starting from a model that would match their body type. Cool. All right, let's, let's, let's hear from a, a couple other ladies. Uh, favorite golf book and best book for beginner, who wants to go? Hey, Krista, go ahead. Krista. Um, I, you got to go with any and lens, you know, be a player. Every shot has a purpose. So it just, there's so much in those. So great for all levels. Harvey Penix, you know, I think, you know, his little red book, there's so much good information in there again for all levels and nothing overly complicated. Again, I'd chime in with Kelly on any of Mike's books. Um, Jim Hardy's books might be a little more advanced, but his book on release, I thought was, was fascinating, a little higher end, but for newer players, probably Penix and anything that P and Lynn have done. And Sarah, and, and then we'll go trill, trill, Sarah, then Trillian. Um, I would say from a outside the golf, learn. it's called Learn Better. Great book to help people understand how to learn better. And then I would go to John Jacobs, Practical Golf. I give that to everybody that's coming up in the business to learn how to teach. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Cool, and Trillian, right? It was yeah, next. John Jacobs, that's a great one. All of these books I love and I have to I have to sort of give thumbs up to. But for me, it was the touch system for better golf. That was Bob Tosky. And Absolutely. I read that before I got into the business. And I remember, so I, you know, I grew up playing lots of sports like all of us. And it just resonated with me, this concept of feel. And that just, that never went away. And he had, had some great visuals for visualizing from behind and, and how you're going to get a sense of tempo and, and kind of being present with it. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, also Davis Love Jr., right, co-authored Touch System, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Is that Thanks. right? I don't remember that, but hey. Yeah, D D Davis is a uh, father. So any other, any other great beginner books, Carol? Well, I or, or just favorite, favorite golf book? I agree with everybody for the beginner books, but um, when I read in Ledbetter's faults and fixes that just really added to my teaching repertoire because um, you know drills are great for people and I just thought that was a phenomenal book. Awesome, awesome. There we go. <laughs> Cheryl's got a good one up there. Okay. Shameless plug. Many people don't know, but I actually wrote a book. It's called Teach Yourself Visually Golf. It's um, just got a lot of pictures in it. So I always um, like that for beginners. Pictures I are love, good. I love um, Mickey Wright's book, Swing the Right Way. That's one of my Bibles. And then um, Rick, yeah. Jensen wrote, Rick Jensen wrote a great book, Easier Said Than Done, that I give a copy to all of my new students because I feel like it's very, along with Lynn and Pia's book, um, but everybody needs to understand that you have to stay on track. You know, you can't jump from teacher to teacher, or swing thought to swing thought. So I feel like that book really outlays the proper structure for learning. Cool. Sarah, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> wish I wish I was I wish I was giving you a lesson at the rock right now. It'd be better, it'd be better than this. <laughs> so okay. If you, if somebody was going to write the check for you, you could do one science or one piece of tech. What would you go? I mean, have the person buy for you. This is a free, free one now. You, oh, that's a tough call. Um, I would say Trackman now only because I'm just learning and diving into what the swing catalyst can share with all the. I mean, every coach has a different opinion on it, so I don't know how valuable it is yet as a useful tool on a daily basis, but track me 
So has anybody got a uh, uh, another like on your wish list? Maybe not waiting for the you know your you know lucky break. To somebody tell you to go buy something on the house. But Carol, yes, what would what would you like to get if uh, if the Lord says the same? I would. Am I on? I would love a simulator yeah. to add to our building. That's the only thing we need. That's, 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 I re highly recommend the TrackMan simulator, which is right, right there. I could, I could hit a button, but I, I'm not going to do that. Go ahead, Trillium. I was at golf, the Golf Swing Simulator headquarters in, in Carlsbad, and they have the putting green. That putting, the green that moves, it is very the cool. One, the, projected, the projected brakes on it? Yep, that's what I would get, a big one. That's uh. That's, that, that, and let me just tell you, I don't know where I'd put it in this thing. The drums would have to move, but that would be high on my list too. Krista? If money's no problem, I would do the gears just because it measures everything and it gives you all the information you would want. You can choose how you use it, but everything is there. But that would be my Christina, opinion. you had a, you had a, a, I saw you. Summing up on the on gears. Summing really, up on gears. Gears is very cool. Great. Okay. Great answers. Okay. So it's, it's Natalie, Natalie's turn. Okay. So going back up here and here we go. Okay. Boy, boy, Natalie gets the tough one. <laughs> so also very, um, also very in vogue is the, the laying this club down from the top. And there's a lot of teachers that like you to kind of stay on top of it the whole way down. Do uh, you have a preference and or a comment on on why it's it become so popular, uh, and uh, wh which one do you tend to prefer? Yeah, and I think that that is definitely in vogue right now. Um, so many people that we teach uh, are slicers of the golf ball, or people that I teach are. And so to me, I find myself teaching that move a ton because of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that on my Instagram and on a lot of the things that we teach, we see so much of the shallow of the golf club, how do we do this? But going back to what Allison said at the beginning, it so depends on the student and the body type for what we're gonna teach in the downswing, what we're gonna teach in the backswing and how to help these people hit it more in the middle of the club face. Anybody got uh, something on the lay, the lay down move and the uh, apparent, apparent semi, uh, uh, I don't like to use the word craze, but it's, it's all but a craze. Go ahead, Allison. Yeah, I mean, I have to speak to it because, of course, George Gankus is in right down the road from me and everyone's trying to get shallow and scooby and um, and I think George is a, is a great teacher. Um, I would say that because of the visual of that being out um, in social media and on YouTube, a lot of people are doing it like in inappropriate ways or it's not fitting their style. And I've heard, I've seen a lot of players, good players, good club players, who have gotten steep early in the swing and then they've shallowed very late to hit a very playable ball flight. And so then they're trying to shallow so much earlier from the top, they're trying to get the center of the mass down below their hands and then rotate through. And then all of a sudden they're starting to hit off the heel and they're not centering the club face in the ball anymore. And so as we kind of go back to like this student centered approach, um, it's talked about a lot because I think that there's been some coolness about it. But again, well, it's all definitely. about that moment of impact. You know, it's getting that ball and that club to line up perfectly. And if you get steep early and then shallow late, but you hit just a nugget right down the middle, why not just keep doing it? So again, it's just kind of dependent on the, the, the ball flight that the player really wants and then what, whether it fits their body. Because if they don't have a lot of ability to uh, move that shoulder, they may not be able to get the golf club shallow in, in the picture that they see out there on the internet. Absolutely. If I, if I wanted to, somebody asked me and they, they do, <laughs> if somebody said, Brian, give us an example of somebody who doesn't overshallow the club, I would give them Annika. So everybody knows Annika kept her head on the left shoulder. It looks like she's looking down the fairway. 
uh, Lynn and, and Pia, as a follow-up to the, to the laydown question, she obviously didn't overshallow the club. Is that something she fought and fixed with 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 that the the little keep the head on the left shoulder move, or was that put in for some other particular reason? Well, actually, there was when she was a junior girl, she used to just stay behind way too much, and she couldn't get through the ball. So. She, Henry Rice was her swing teacher for, for, uh, during most of her career. And so she, he just started doing exercises because she was just never getting to a good finish. And she's really tight in her neck muscles too, especially when she was younger. So, so that move just helped her get through the ball and to the finish. It was totally based on something else. And uh, uh, so that's where it came from. And it's her, like all of us have unique fingerprints with our swings. Like no great players swings have ever looked the same. So that is a you know true fingerprint for Annika Sorenstam. That just how her body functions, especially to hit good shots on the golf course. Sure, sure. Any anybody got anything else on the on the on the lay down fad craze, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> In style right now. It's, it's cool. It's it's Gucci. Go ahead, Krista. Um, I think it can be dangerous if people, you know, kind of to Allison's point, if people don't know how it affects their ball play and their, in, their impact, and say they're already a little shallow, and then they start to drop it under more. And now they're coming in so much from the inside, their swing direction gets so far to the right. I think it's helpful for those that kind of maybe steep in the shaft too early or get kind of vertical, then they can shallow it, then they can steep it late. I don't mind that move, but I think it all goes back to where is their impact and understanding everything we do in the golf swing, either affects impact by making it steeper and shallower and you're kind of balancing out is my overall swing and, and impact tend to be too steep or too shallow do I need more of that do I need less of that and kind of comes into delivering what allows you to deliver that golf club effectively for you body mobility as well to Allison's point on the external shoulder rotation but they think they need to know where it fits in the golf swing and I, I don't think there's a lot of people that can get real savvy with that you know it, it fits some but it, it i think you've got to take it and understand how it affects you is it going to make your impact way too shallow or is it gonna is it like to christina's point you know where they way too steep and that move does help them shallow it out um but it's got to be balanced in there and it's got to always come back to ball flight and impact and what's happening there i got a little follow-up for, for krista and then i'm going to go to trillium and lynn uh on, on that now you you work with the uh Jim Hardy and 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 uh, and Chris and uh, Matt Kuchar at one point right before he w worked with them more of an upright swing kind of dropped it and yeah. get, got got too underneath it I wouldn't say too shallow but maybe he did but I know it was definitely under and out to the right and he that was part of was wasn't that a big part I'm sure they've gone over the that change. Yeah. Matt he didn't see a hook. So the biggest thing from day one with him working with Chris and Jim was he didn't want to see the ball, the ball hook or draw at all. So for him, it was always, it's always more about steepening the downswing and impact and keeping his path more to the left to keep the ball from going left. Gotcha. Trillium? Can't help but think during this conversation too. I mean, I, I, building on this, that if somebody's body has gone through years and years and years of a particular move, we've just kind of have to honor that. It, particularly if they're not an elite level athlete and they don't have a whole slew of people working with them and it's not their full-time job. So if the move is to get a little steep and they can hit the ball pretty well, why are we going to try to reinvent the wheel and fix it? So I, I always get a little nervous when, when we start talking about in fat, you know, there's a lot out there that people can just find on their own that could actually just get them worse if it's not in line with, like many of you just said, what they either already do already, what their bodies want to do, or something that suits their their history. Perfect. Uh, Susie and then Lynn. Hey, Susie. Hey. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to be here and just chat about golf uh, in the instruction zone <laughs> instead of in the world zone. So I appreciate being a part of this. But, you know, I, I listening has been amazing and uh, the books and, and the theories. I, I always look at it from the seat I'm in currently, not only as a coach, um, but as somebody who wants the game to grow. So I couldn't be any more excited about this fad uh, because we have 
thousands of people trying to increase their ball speed, um, and a majority of them um, don't understand how to do it. And so what does that do? That sends them from the internet uh, to us as coaches so that we can navigate that for them. We can kind of tread that zone of ability versus repetition. I mean, I mean, my students today, I'm, I'm not in a development place anymore. I was in a development place for a very long time where I had youth that, that we could kind of morph that motion, the kinematic sequence, and then go into force and kinetics, right? Now I'm in a situation where I'm trying to decrease dispersion. I'm trying to help people lower scores. Lynn and Pia have been instrumental uh, with me on that, put through their books and conversations and learnings and coaching, uh, where most of it's strategic. Um, I'm not gonna change a whole lot of kinematic sequence for a lot of people I'm currently teaching. So do I shallow out the shaft for some and have elbows coming down first? 100%. Uh, do I have people swinging left and a steep angle attack for others? 100%. Do I have uh, the ability to use technology in a way that can help people? I do. Do I use it for every lesson? I don't. Uh, do I still use 2D? I do. I use a lot of video. I send a lot of video lessons to people, um, even though I have a track man. So I, I think for teachers and coaches who may be paying attention and listening, you know, um, love the moment you're in and the moment you're in it. We used to use chalk right, as track line, as, and chalk and baby powder, uh, string and baby powder, sorry, um, as our track man. Uh, we figured it out <laughs> pretty simply and easily with physics. Um, so you don't need, you know, I've listened to so many Instagram lives and, and a lot of these, and, you know, I worry for young teachers thinking to be a great teacher, you have to have the greatest technology. And while we all, to Chris's point, man, I would love gears, um, while we all want these things, um, it's not necessary to become a great coach. Uh, great coaching takes human behavior skill uh, assessment, um, how people change behavior, uh, how to get in the human mind. Um, if I had anything to do over again, and then I'll stop talking, it would be I would take a ton of behavioral science classes in college. Uh, because what we're trying to do as coaches is help people change behavior. And I think that's incredibly hard to do, um, but also be their partner in this game that, that oftentimes uh, leaves them, right? Um, to where we're partnering with them to help them to their goals. So for me, that would be it. But uh, I, 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 for one, am thrilled. If anybody has a fad on the internet that has to do with golf, I'm all in. Lynn. Uh, for some reason, there we go. There we go. Yeah. yeah, I'm just gonna go back to the shallow and steep. And I'll just say, we've coached Gary Jatanagar in the last four years, five, five years. And it's- Can you please who, 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 say the name again? I'm sorry, Lynn. Who did Jeffrey you coach last four five? Oh, gotcha. Yeah. And so actually, I mean, May, her, her nickname is May. She's had some swing teachers and she's had a couple of them in the last couple of years, but she actually asks us a lot for technical advice. And I think that there's been a couple of teachers and times when they tried to get her too shallow, when her pattern is definitely to come in steep. And, and my God, I mean, she's one of the best ball strikers women's game has ever seen by far. I mean, she's the best uh, LPJ player I've ever seen in a golf ball, just in terms of ball striking. So I just think I'm just going to say from a pure technical perspective that her trying to get it, you know, more shallow. It's not been a, a good thing for her at all because her pattern is definitely to come in steep. Cool. Yeah. I just want to uh, follow up on uh, what, what Susie said. I, I've been doing this 38 years, and, and at this point in time, I, you know, fool around with a little science and I've got some technology in this room I'm in right here. And the only thing you have to do, young teachers, is make people play better, have more fun, and shoot lower scores. That's it. How you do it, that's, that's, uh, that's on you. Trillium. This is a great question for you because it's a future question, and that's uh, that's good. Instead of asking some old fossil like me this question, what's one thing that you want to do in your career that you haven't been able to do yet? In Ooh. Teaching? Ooh, you're gonna open a can of worms here. <laughs> yeah, it's the idea of this show. <laughs> well, you know, this has been a a good time to really think about that and shuffle the deck in terms of what my priorities are and where I want to spend my time. It's important to me that good, that good solid information is coming from coaches. So, you know, I've spent a lot more time on social media, kind of in an outward facing role 
and um, speaking to the average player. So that I don't know where that's going to go, but that's been pretty a pretty rewarding place. Just hearing a lot of feedback from that. Now, ten years, twenty years. I don't know. I admire Susie for what you're doing. Got to admit, I look up to Susie quite a bit in in the leadership role that that she has, which is not just with um, not just with women, not just with men, but not just golf, really, even with sport in general, and how people are um, engaging in sport and and what kinds of issues are surrounding sport and how they're involved in in politics. So we'll see what happens. A little frog in my throat here. Anybody else got some big goal out there that they that they're striving toward that we need to hear about, Miss Pia? Oh, I do have a dream, and I I um, I know Lynn shares it with me too. That for the future of the game, that we realize that there are like two sets of golf fundamentals. I mean, there's always if you're going to play golf, you need enough technique to be able to play the game. But there are these non-technical golf fundamentals, and I have a dream that they get equal footing and equal treatment from the first time golfers ever start this game. I just know from the bottom of my heart that it would make such a huge difference in how the game can grow and how many golfers would actually enjoy it and play well and not wait till my swing is good enough before I learn the skills of playing. That's a, that's a, that's a great goal. Anybody, anybody got one more, one more thing that they got some young people on here now, you know, I'm 58. now. You're, you're, I got things I want to do. I got like a list that's this long. <laughs> some of you, some of you younger ladies should have at least one good one. Come on, Natalie. Uh, what what's something you want to do that you haven't done yet? That you that you it's a goal. What's a career good career goal from from Natalie? Um, I still really love to play, um, and so that is still on my radar. Obviously, not playing full time. I am teaching full time, but. Um, you know, I'm signed up for a U.S. Open qualifier. I love playing and all that stuff. So it'll be really fun to qualify for a big event. Um, I know some of the ladies on here have played in majors and PGA Tour events. So um, I just love to play and would love to keep competing. Awesome, awesome. Okay, next, next, next question, Lynn. Let's see here. I was just on here. Uh, Give us two or three uh, for the folks. So you got two types of people watching us tonight, right? You got other fellow male and female golf pros and golf teachers, right? And you've got golfers. So I think if you're a uh, golf aficionado, you've heard of everybody that I've had on the show last time and, and it wouldn't take very much to, to know all of you ladies. So give us two or three places to look that maybe might be uh, hiding under a rock someplace. That might not be the right way to say it, but less known good sources of information that you would recommend to uh, both golfers and, and, uh, and golf pros. Ooh. <laughs> I, uh, by the way, I was under a rock for, for most of my life. So. I, I think. Uh... Good place for me. Yeah, I think an area that <clears throat> isn't looked at enough is how to help people pay attention. And so we could talk about meditation. <laughs> we could talk just, in, you know, today in today's world and all this technology that we're using right now, people's attention span has, is, is half of what it used to be 10 years ago. Meaning that people's minds are flipping around like everybody here in our little square. We're flipping around about every six seconds to a new thought. And if you just think about that, that we need to learn to pay attention for the golf swing. Okay. And the golf swing and what we call the play box, the time it takes to actually hit a shot. So maybe nine to 10 to 12 seconds. We need to actually help people to do that. So I think there's lots of resources out there to learn how to pay attention. Susie? I mean, meditation would be I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Lynn, go ahead. No, I would just say learning how to meditate or looking at some other resources outside of golf with meditation would be really valuable. Great. Susie and then, and then Christina. Yeah, uh, what's been really helpful beyond the enormous amount of mentors that have 
helped me learn uh, how to be with people, how to coach, how to teach is uh, I seek out uh, presentation books, people who are amazing at presentations. I think as a coach, you're giving a presentation every time you're in front of somebody, whether it's one person or multiple people and the better skill set you have for that, uh, the more engaging I think the person in front of you will feel like you're a part of it. I seek out coaching books uh, from, from, you know, renowned coaches. John Wooden is, is probably one of my favorites. Um, I seek out anything that can give me a mindset um, that's adaptable to golf, um, but I can learn uh, in instances that they share in, in writings or on the internet now, obviously. I mean, I have this enormous amount of, of books in my house, which cracks me up because now they're all on the internet and on audio. Um, but I still love to go through them and look at my notes from when I was Natalie's age, um, when I put little notes in the sidebar to what I think about today. And um, I think, you know, anybody can go to the library, not now, obviously, which is unfortunate. Um, but when it reopens, like dive into some coaching books. It doesn't mean that you're going to actually like that methodology or system, um, but it'll give you little nuggets of, of things that certainly I have brought to the lesson team with me um, uh, beyond what so many have helped me uh, become and learn to do. Okay, I saw, I saw a couple of hands go up. So let's go, Cheryl. Years. One second, Cheryl, there you go. Please start over. I spent a couple of years with um, an education person that helps my daughter. My daughter has Down syndrome. So this lady helped me to understand how to coach my students more effectively, kind of similar to Carol Dweck's grit. And I've put all of my drills into like four different categories. So there's a basic level and then there's the toughest level at level four. So when I'm working with groups now, I don't hear, oh, I'm bored with this drill, right? So they each have their different challenge point. So that's what I've been into a lot lately. You know, not trying someone, but um, with too much information, just kind of knowing where their challenge point is and, you know, pushing them through that. I saw another, yeah, Christina and then Krista. I'm very interested in what Dr. Debbie Cruz is doing with her OptiTrain and really training to Lynn's point. Your, your right and your left brain and trying to find that synchronicity and quieting the mind before you perform. Because again, to Lynn's point, we are so distracted that even standing over the ball having a million swing thoughts is a problem <laughs> for a lot of players. So really learning how to train, how to quiet the mind and I really like what she's doing. I'm, I have a question for everyone here. Has anyone tried her OptiTrain or use it in your coaching? I think that's a decent percentage. I, I hadn't heard of it, but I'm gonna look into it right away. I feel really bad about that, haven't, but that's, that's all awesome. She's a smart lady and I'm sure she's, uh, she's, she's probably working on something that's pretty good. Pretty good, Krista, and then uh, and then uh, P and Lynn. On Lynn's point on the focus and paying attention, I mean, spot on. Uh, Cheryl's point with performance and how to practice. I still think people in this game, they still practice so poorly and still have such a hard time transitioning to the golf course and making making that productive. So I think anything that really can gain them understanding of how to practice properly, how to be more performance oriented. How to really see, I mean, the stats like game forms that Mark Sweeney's doing, where you can really uncover, is it a ball striking issue? Is it putting? Is it chip, short game and chipping? Really, you know, is it my, my, my pre, you know, preparation? And uh, there's so many different facets, but really uncovering, where is performance? I think we need to go, I think that's going to be a big area of improvement for everyone is just staying more performance oriented on the golf course and helping our students better prepare and train for that. Pia? So what Lynn was saying, this paying attention, but what we've noticed and even more the last few years, that there's so many players that they're not present in their bodies when they're swinging. <laughs> and no matter what they're going to work on technically, if you can't even feel what you're doing, it's not going to happen. So we just realized we need to like, 
you know, first make sure, can you pay attention for a few seconds? And even when we check that with tour players, many of them are like really bad at it. They lose it at the top of the backswing or they lose it at impact. So paying attention, but then actually feel the body. And it could be so simple. Can you make a swing and feel your feet? Can you make a swing and feel your thighs? Can you make a swing and feel your core? But just making sure that the golfers we are coaching, that they are actually it can experience and be in the sensory modality of field before moving on to, you know, teaching technical things. That's something that we've been like, wow, we can't just skip over this step. Dana? Hey, Dana. Uh, great, uh, great point, uh, everybody. I think golfers more, more now than ever are very disorganized in their thoughts. And they, they're reading stuff on magazines, books, and so when they get over the golf ball, they have no idea. They're, they're trying to plan their swing to Pian Lin's point of being in the performance box is about performing and behind the ball is about planning and preparation. And I think that golfers need to understand that there's a lot of ways to get to where you wanna go, but you gotta pick one. You can't pick five or 10 or 15 different ways or, or changing your, your thought process every time you hit a bad shot. So looking for solutions in how you make it better rather than focusing on the error. So like when I give a lesson, uh, somebody will come over the top or hit it bad and, and they'll say to me, what did, I, what did I do wrong? And I say, why, do you wanna do it again? No, you don't wanna do that again. Let's, let's, let's focus on the solution to how you get a process that keeps your brain organized so that you can hit shots that will produce a playable ball flight. We had another hand, uh, Carol. So recently, I'm not on yet, I don't think. Yes, you're on, you're on. Oh, okay, my little green light didn't come on. So recently a member came to me and he had been mm -hmm. taking lessons to try to shift his weight get his hips through, swing with his chest, and he's shanking the ball. And so the first thing I asked him was, what is your awareness of how you're doing this? Where do you think the club head is at impact? And he didn't know. He couldn't even show me. He couldn't, he didn't know if it was the toe. He didn't know if it was a hosel. He didn't know. So we go in and hit 10 or 12 shots on track man his path is fine his face is open 19 degrees 15 degrees 20 degrees it's just hosel 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 all day so when he saw those numbers and he understood what that was then we went outside and we sat down for a half hour and we just talked about the club head and the club face and what are the pro what's the primary influence and he said my arms i said no your hands and we moved, we felt the club head and we moved the club head for 30 minutes. And he had to have an understanding of what was happening before anything could change. And I, that's what everybody on here understands. We completely agree with what everybody's saying. The student has to understand exactly what they're doing or else they can't make a change. No doubt about it. One of the things that I, I was hoping for in that question and bad moderating, so I'm going to ask the whole group before I go to Pia's uh, question directed to her, is out of this group now, I got a lot of smart people here. I want five underrated teachers for people to look up. So anybody who wants to start, go ahead. I don't want any of these people everybody's heard of now. Go ahead, Natalie myself here. Um, I'm going to shout out another Natalie, Natalie Schmidt. She's um, out in Arizona. She's teaching some girls um, that play on the LPGA tour and doing some cool stuff. So great. Okay. Karen. Um, yes. Michael Hunt. He's out of, um, well, he was with Jim McLean. I used to teach with Michael Hunt and also Erica Larkin. Um, she's a great young teacher. She's a great presence on social media. Very simple um, with her videos. She's a great, uh, person to follow if you like the social media aspect of golf. Okay, we need about two or three more. Who's, who's, who's got somebody for me? Susie Whaley. One yeah. second, there you go, go ahead, Susie. So, you know, I, I gotta go with Debbie Doniger. Uh, 
she amazing a student of the game amazing teacher Colin Amaral that I work with uh Shannon Hamill that I work with Jimmy Buell that I work with um you know I just the people that I'm with currently are amazing teachers uh, I think they're underrated they don't get enough attention and they need more cool anybody got any, any, anybody else Dana and, and uh, then Kelly and Carol and we'll go to the PS question yeah go ahead. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go with Bruce Wilkins uh works for me at Belfair but I can tell you, probably after we finish this, I'll come up with about 10 more names, but uh, that's my name right now. <laughs> awesome, Kelly and then Carol. Yeah. I'm lucky, I've got some great people. Stephanie Shaw uh, comes to mind. She's an amazing young instructor, yeah, also teaches Stephanie, at Savonic. It, it broke up for me, Stephanie Shaw. Stephanie Shaw, she teaches with me okay. at Boca Hotel and also at Sabonic. And then also at Palm Beach Part 3, a gentleman named Gene George, who is amazing with juniors. And we've taught a lot together. His cause and effect understanding is unbelievable. He's an off-the-charts great teacher here in Palm Beach. Great. I'm hearing some good new names. Carol? Hey, uh, Eddie Cochran. Go ahead. E.C. Cochran. Eddie Cochran. He teaches at the River Course. He's an up-and-coming teacher. And a guy that I've, I've worked with that is all over the charts, but we love him to death. He's phenomenal with golf fitness, and he does not get enough credit is J.J. Butcher. Awesome. Great. That's what I wanted to hear. Y'all helped me out a lot. Okay, Pia, this one's for you. So we're going to give you a, because, you know, golf's going to come back here, hopefully, right? And... Uh, they're going to get everybody ready the week before, let's say. This is my little fantasy. And they're going to do a show, you know, and get everybody ready. in a, a national show, CBS, Golf, whatever. And they're going to give you, Pia, a 15-minute spot to impart your wisdom on, on the golf world. What is the main message you're going to give these people with this national television audience from, you know, if, if you wanted to, obviously you would want to help the most people with that time. Go ahead. Most of them are so eager to go and play golf. And I think when that comes, there isn't going to be enough time to make major swing changes they want to play. So I would want to get them across that when they, they play, that they absolutely promise to have made up their mind about the decision before stepping into a shot. And then they... It learn, and then they learn to commit to that to the finish of the swing. And the second so, thing, so, so, so let me let me do a follow up on that. Uh, not to interrupt, but I, I I think it's very important. So that's why I want to, so people can hear this. Give me an example, or everybody who's listening, an example of decision. What does that mean? But so many still step into decision today, and they they're over the ball, and they say, "Oh, maybe it's a six iron instead of the seven iron." They're like they haven't made up their mind if they have the right club, but that they trust the club. So it's to trust the club and where they're aiming and what shot they're going to hit. And for us, is what are they going to focus on when they're swinging? So the second thing is to, when they go out and play, then you make the decision about the shot, but then you need to decide. Okay, I want to see the ball flight, or I want to feel my shoulders rot rotating, I want to stick my finish, something that they can actually pay attention to, because you can't commit to something if you don't have something to commit to. So it would be to make a decision and have something to focus on that they're going to stay with till they stick their finish. Yeah. And then if I can do one more thing, I would just yes. simply play and um, play th three holes and only say what you liked about you, what you did after every shot. <laughs> just since you start playing just to build a little bit more of a positivity bias so um that would be a good start and that would only take maybe three minutes to do yes so you see now because pia was so generous and only took three minutes everybody else gets 30 seconds so anybody get the, the right behind pia gave them the commit to the shot and be ready you know exactly what she said what else are you going to tell this national television audience to make a whole bunch of people play better just with a 30 second, 45 second idea? Who wants to go? Go ahead, uh, Allison and then Carol. 
I would say that this only applies uh, not only to golf, but to life too, is really get comfortable with being uncomfortable. So with a lot of us coming out from maybe 30 to 45 day break from golf, there's going to be a lot of uncomfortable sensations that you're going to experience. There's going to be some newness on the golf course. And if you can tolerate being comfortable with those uncomfortable feelings, you're certainly going to be accepting a variability and certainly going to be able to play better. So it kind of decreases your expectations to say, I should be doing this, or um, when I go out to play, I should be shooting the score. It's like, just be comfortable with all the differences, the challenges, the wonderfulness, um, the negatives, and be comfortable with all of that. And ultimately, you're going to be able to adapt to any situation that comes your way. Anybody got another one? Was somebody about but please, Leah, and then, uh, I mean, I'm Lynn, and then we'll go Carol, and I think it was Trillium or Krista. We got a bunch of them, but let's start with Lynn. Yeah, just waiting for my green light. No. Oh, there yes. Is. Okay, so, yeah, I would just ask the golfer, say, okay, about to go out and play golf, and of course you want to shoot a low score. So put that aside, and now pick one other goal that you'd like to achieve while you're on the golf course today and have it be a goal that's 100% under your control. So something that's not outcome related, of course everybody wants to shoot lower scores, but to pick a different goal that's more intrinsic and that doesn't have to do with an ex extrinsic outcome. And then can, can we- give us, Can you give us an example? Oh, it could be, can I come off the 18th green with more energy than when I started on the first tee? Yeah. Great. Krista? And then Trill? Um, I would say two things. One, commit. Kind of piggyback P and Lynn's comments there. So commit to the shot you're going to hit, what you're going to do. Secondly, get rid of tension. So free things up. I think people just harbor so much tension, whether it's in the shoulders or the hands or the arms or, you know, obviously even in their head. So just get rid of the tension, free it up, and kind of just let it go. Make a commitment and then monitor where you store your attention, understand that, free it up, and enjoy it. And just get, kind of get an understanding of what your swing is, but just, I think the tension and just letting it go and, and making a commitment beforehand. Trillium and then Carol and Sarah. Trill? So the, the audience is the audience is people coming out of quarantine? Well, yeah, I mean, we're, I mean, some some people look at they're playing an English turn today. You know, there was record number of people out there. So, so, but what I'm saying is, it's you, you've got this national television audience a week before the tour comes back, and they just give us this show with this opportunity. And Pia had 15 minutes, but she said she just needs three. So you've got 30 seconds, and we're divvying up this time, and they're going to give O'Brien 10 seconds at the end. So no, 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 I've got 10 30. seconds because I needed the question repeated. <laughs> That's okay. That's my yeah. job. So I don't know. I, I like real practical stuff in this case. So I'd say get to the drive. If you're going to like, this is a tip for someone to go play, get, and you haven't played in a while and you're real jazzed up, go to the, go to the practice area early and work on a 30, 40 yard shot. Then do it from the rough, then do it from a tight lie and just start getting a good feel for contact again. Cause that's just, that's real basic. If you get a 30, 40 yard shot, you'll do all right. Cause you don't need to be perfect off the tee or down the fairway, but you kind of have to have that shot dialed in if you want to score. You're going to have a few of them, Carol and Cheryl and then Sarah. I would, I would, <laughs> Carol say, I would say just go out there and be yourself. Don't try to reinvent the wheel since you haven't played in a while and swing your swing, play your game, be yourself because everybody else is already taken. And know that golf, the only thing about golf that's consistent is that it is random and inconsistent. And so you, I got this from P and Lynn, your ability to adapt is gonna allow you to enjoy the game and have fun. Okay, Cheryl, and then Sarah. I bring Karen Jansen on with me to do the cardio golf warm up because most of the people that go to play golf, they're literally, they arrive like 10 minutes before the first tee shot. And if they could, you know, get like five good stretches before they play, that would help them a lot. Sarah, you, what's your 30 seconds? Great. So I got to teach people finally in six weeks today that haven't played in six weeks. So I have a little experience or warm up on this, but I would say curiosity, 
Like, I don't think people are curious enough about why things happen or what happened, like the how and the why, instead of turning and asking other people try to figure it out for themselves. But I'm totally into commitment, like see the shot, if you can make the shot happen. But then if it doesn't happen, be curious as to why it didn't. Cool. And so, I, I know there was at least a couple more. So, uh, Christina? I would say if you focused on your rhythm and your tempo and really just focused on that, if your tempo was smooth, it hides a lot of the swing flaws. <laughs> swing flaws if you have them, if you haven't played in a while. So if you just focused on tempo and rhythm, I think that would work really well for coming off hiatus. Anybody got another one? Oh, oh yeah, Kelly, sorry. There we go, Kelly. Yeah, that's okay. No, I think that we just need to get out there and have fun and relax. I might go a little bit the other direction. I think these are all great answers, but just do what you have to do to have fun. Play your own personal scramble. I mean, have as many mulligans as you want. Just everybody's gonna be so excited to get back out there. And if I think if you gotta break the rules a little bit, hit a few extra shots, go for it. Just make it fun. It's gonna be great. Shows you how hopeless a mechanics teacher I am. I would have done out of a 30 second left hand grip uh, deal. So I feel bad. <laughs> anyway, okay. So uh, Susie, you have one. She gets the last 30 seconds. I'm just going to say that I actually have to do this in real time, took notes, but I'm not doing yours, Brian. <laughs> not happening. So my point is, I actually have to somebody, go on and do it. Um, and welcome the world back to the game. So thank you all for your answers. We're so excited. I think having fun, being joyful, remembering how to be joyful uh, when you play the game, uh, make that a part. And I think as people come back to all of us as coaches, we as coaches need to understand the value that people are looking for will be at the highest it's ever been. So you have to determine what is that value. It has to be about the person standing in front of you. It can't be about your coaching. It has to be about you giving them an experience that makes their lives better. Great answer. So Krista, this question is for you. What is something that you once taught and really believed that you just don't teach anymore? Oh, um, you know, I think we're all kind of a product of our, our background and our early development and where, how we learned the game. Um, so in, I'm going to throw a name out there. It might come back and haunt me, but I'm sure a lot of you know this person. Um, when I was working on my game full-time out in Arizona, I was coached by Easy Ed Oldfield. Um, and uh, uh, he, his, the main thing I worked on was extension and extending my arms and, you know, down, you know kind of hitting. I had hundreds and hundreds of this little punch shots working on extension, which – is fine for a certain shot, probably made my impact a little better, my you know hand position and wrist angles better at impact and they trap the ball well. Um, but I, I was so much from the inside and fought a hook. And then I would get on the, on the, you know, in certain shots and in competition and my swing would just get way too shallow. And um, I'll never forget being introduced to Jim Hardy and talking about golf swing and my own swing and what I need to work on. And um, I probably won't repeat his comment about Ed's knowledge about fixing hooks and um, but it probably just wasn't the best person for me. Um, I, he had worked with a lot of great players, but I think it's important um, as a teacher to know who the person is in front of you, what their impact in ball flight is and, and what everything affects that impact. So um, it just it for me, I didn't have an understanding of the forward part of the arc in the swing. Everything was so much backswing to impact where now I probably spend more time on leaving the backswing alone and working on delivery and the forward part of the arc and helping people, helping people there. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with Mike Adams at early young teaching age. And so what I learned from him was such so much invaluable information as far as creating a blueprint for that student in front of me. Um, but I probably don't work a lot on, unless someone is way, you know, they're really going left, and then I'll start working on some punch shots and trying to get that path crazy to the right. But I think it brings up, you know, haunts of my own, my own ghosts of ghosts of Christmas past. Right, okay. right. <laughs> All right, Karen, you 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 got one that you don't you used to teach, you used to think was 
a-okay, but you wouldn't teach anybody now unless you had to. Well, not to pile on to Ed, but I took lessons from Ed too. And, um, and you know, this was back in the day. And, you know, he said that all women golfers should actually have a bowed left wrist at the top, hit a hook, Krista, like that. So, you know, that's, that's what I learned. And, 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 and I taught that for a little while. And obviously now we know that you can't teach just one way. You have to look at the person and what they're doing. But I, I would say, um, you know, it's not necessary to teach everyone how to hit a hook shot because, you know, it just, it's not necessary. Sure. Any, anybody else, something just the mechanic doesn't have to have a, a person attached to it, just a mechanical idea that used to, uh, let's go Kelly and then Cheryl. Yeah, I would say the way I teach short game has really changed. Like I look back at some of the pictures of teaching chipping like ball way back, handle way forward, like hold the angle. And you could get away with that a little bit when the grass was longer. But I think as the lies got tighter and these kind of high end private clubs have really short fairways, kind of over time, I realized that that just isn't going to work at all. So short game between a heck of a lot sh less shuffling and chipping and obviously completely opposite release patterns for pitching. So my short, my short game instruction has changed drastically. Uh, Carol, I'm sorry, Carol. I would say, I would say with the um, short game putting, um, you know, you're, you're not a triangle. You've got to get the elbows out and, and trying to read a putt with your eyes. I mean, when I, when I got aim point certified, that woke up my left brain, like nothing. I mean, it was, it was phenomenal. So i the way I teach putting and green reading has completely changed and it evolves. It continues to evolve. Any, anybody got another used to be Sarah? And now, uh, uh, now. Am I, am I, oh, so I would say like, yeah, you're remember, on. like in 2004, teaching people to take a short backswing on their putter. And wait, wait, back to 2004. I mean, short backstroke to long follow through. And now that I understand physics and David Orr's help, I'm like, that's the worst information I could have given anybody. Allison, you had one? I think a lot of my early teaching right out of college was just based on how I was taught as a junior golfer and a collegiate golfer. And um, I was always taught to really load and shift that, that um, weight over to the right side. And I think now we know that there's people that, that play better from posting on the lead leg and play better with a center pelvis. And then some people play better more um, posting onto the right side. So instead of fitting everybody into like shift really hard into that trail side, um, now I'm kind of customizing it per um, per player. So I think that for me has been the biggest shift in my teaching. Cool. Cheryl, you had one? Teach, uh, keep the right knee bent. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no more. So let that knee extend, helps them to turn a lot easier. It's def definitely, there was a lot of that at some point I, when I started teaching. I tell you, the first time I gave a lesson and told somebody to straighten their right leg, they looked at me like they thought I was kidding. Go ahead, Carol. Um, swinging in to out because the club doesn't go out. It goes yeah. up and to the left through impact. So I will never, right. ever do that again. <laughs> we, we, we might come back to this now. We, 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 we chewing on a good bone there. Okay, this is a custom question for Susie. So. Um, this has always been uh, a, a near and dear question to, to me because I've been asked, and since everybody knows I have an opinion about everything, I, I've given my opinion, and I just want you to know ahead of time, in case you've never read it, it was a very positive opinion in the direction I'm going. So uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot of uh, people that are in, uh, you know, generation, basically one younger than me. They can almost be my kid, but not quite. Um, and, and some of them who could be, uh, who became well-known successful teachers without becoming a PGA member, which I am a PGA member. And, and, and by the way, I once asked if I could be an LPGA member, but I was told no, but I would have done it. I promise you, I would still do it. So, um, what would you say, Susie, to the to two groups of people? Okay. Uh, the, the group that it's not too late 
you know, you know, to, 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 to go ahead and become a PGA member if they're a full time teacher. And what would you say to the younger teachers that are thinking about, well, you know, I don't know how much money I have to spend, but, but you know, the, uh, you know, this guy and this guy and this guy, they're all on these lists and they're teaching tour players and they're not PGA members. Why should I do it? Yeah, I mean, you're spot on, right? So, you know, the LPGA has a test out at their level three. We have a test out at ours. We certainly hope anybody that's an LPGA teacher would see the value of becoming a PGA teacher and, and vice versa. Um, not just for the camaraderie, but we think all, all, all boats rise when we work together. I can tell you though, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say this past meeting, uh, many of the teachers, not all, all of course, this is a generalization, but many of the teachers who are members of other PG associations around the world were unable to join the PG of America because we had a citizenship clause in our constitution. Um, that citizenship clause, thankfully, at our last annual meeting has been removed. We worked very hard for 10 years <laughs> on doing that, and, and we're really proud of the fact that that's been removed. So, so many of the teachers who are living in the United States on work visas or have become, you know, had green card to be here, um, we really welcome them to be part of the association, and, and now we do. So I'm excited to share that with you. Um, if you think of something good coming out of COVID, which is, is actually hard to actually enunciate out loud um, because it's such a challenging and so tragic for so many people. But if you look at the opportunity that it developed for us, um, working for six years on an online portal for the beginning of our degrees, our association uh, as an associate. So um, we have a PGM university program with a separate of speak to now, which is PG, the PGM program. And we wanted to build this online opportunity to lower cost, uh, to lower the time it takes to become a PGA professional, but keep the skill level very high. Um, that met with a lot of, of friction uh, within our association for multiple reasons. We have people who um, have worked incredibly hard to become members and they're proud of that and feel like everybody should have to do the same as they did, no matter what program they went through. Um, they don't want the skill level to get lowered, which you know we don't believe is, we believe our is stronger than it's ever been. But COVID has, has pushed that. Uh, we were ready uh, with our first two levels and we are delivering it totally online uh, at literally an eighth of the cost to the associates uh, that are going through it. Uh, we're building out level three now. And, you know, I don't see us uh, going back from that. I, you know, I, I hope that we continue that uh, and deliver it in a way that's tangible and gives a value to people taking it. We certainly want people the PGA of America as an association that offers resources and tools within their sections locally. Um, we believe no matter who it is, that's a teacher could benefit from wearing our logo. Um, I actually had this conversation with two very, very high level teachers today who I won't name, uh, but I told them it's my responsibility to continue to push them <laughs> um, to get there. So, you know, we have to come up with a way to welcome people who have been teaching for 20 years time uh, successfully uh, with consumers that are loving the game and bringing people to courses um, to welcome them into our association. We're still striving for that. We're not there yet, um, but I'm excited at some point, a leader behind me or within uh, our tenure now that our board will get it done. Great, great. Oh, uh, Christina, go ahead, follow up, Christina. I'm happy to report I've passed level one, level two. I have one more test and I'm PGA. <laughs> I'm excited. Anybody got, anybody got anything to add on the uh, uh, a good reason to become for somebody that's either not an LPGA or a PGA member to, to go ahead and, and, and do it? Uh, the, the, the thing that I always say, uh, not that I'm asking myself, but before I saw the hands go up, is I always say, I don't, I, I cannot think of a teacher and I can name a bunch who everybody here has heard of certainly that are not PGA members. I don't know which baby butch, but that's about it, that it wouldn't help their career because of just the increased opportunities that they would get. Some, somebody raise their hand. Sorry, Trillium and then Natalie and then Dana. Go ahead, Trillium. Yeah, I've had the good fortune to be um, an itty bitty part of the the, the process of building out pga.coach and involved in the conversation of building out resources and, you know, more context and 
information and support and help kind of in a more strategic way. Not that it's getting done the second, but you know, things happen, they happen, just gotta be patient. And I think that the PGA of America is moving in such an incredible direction. And I think there are a number of different factors for, for why that's happening. But one of them is the game realizes, we realize that, that as, as PGA members, we're all coaches, whether or not you want to be one or not. If you're a PGA member, you have, to be, you have to be part of the game and part of supporting the development of the game. And I think that now more than ever, the opportunities to, to really learn and grow and develop networks and to have those resources is becoming um, is being realized and becoming more and more an amazing opportunity. Cool, cool, Dadley. Um, so I just got my PGA membership in November of last year, and um, yeah. the and I'm so thankful because when I was working for Susie um, originally, she pushed me to do it as soon as I graduated from college. I did my playing ability test right away and got into it right away, and a lot of the top jobs that people are seeking out require you to have that or be on track to be doing that. And so it just helps you get a step up on so many other people if you can get ahead of it and have that behind your name or next to your name. No, no doubt about it. So next question for Deb Angelo. Hello, Deb. How are you? Great to see, great to see your face. Thank you. Um, what, what of all the things that you've ever taught, you know, how long have you been? I've been doing this 38 years. How long have you been teaching? Not as long, 27, but pretty good. That's a long time. <laughs> that is. So what's one thing that you can think of, of? And if you want to add a second, that's fine. But what's one thing that maybe an idea might be a drill might, that has lasted the longest time that comes to your mind that, you know, I was teaching that 20 something years ago and now i'm i'm still teaching it well the time. You know, i can think of a couple of things but i'll go with the pivot only because i spent so many years learning with mike austin and it was just invaluable information because how better the pivot became for a student the easier rotation was so it just it just got them hitting the ball a long way it was very very efficient and really his secret for why he hit it so long. I, I have, uh, I've seen the book, which book is it of his that's like, it's, it's a spiral bound, like put together book. Is it, is it, well, the name? it probably um, wasn't his. It was one of his, one of his students that wrote that and it took a lot of his information because Mike oh. didn't publish much and he was actually working on something up to the day he died, which was too bad. But, you know, those of us who spend so many years with him have that information, you know, up here in our mind, and just don't have it in written form. But a lot of people have written some pretty good stuff on, on him and gotten published nicely. Absolutely, great answers. Anything that uh, uh, anyone wants to add to that, something that they've taught for a long time that it, it, or, or maybe it's a drill or something that that's worked for like almost your whole career. Anything you could think of. I used to teach everybody. I've been doing this a long time. I used to teach everybody to have their left arm and club in a line. Like a lot of good teachers teach probably some of you ladies. I went to see Ben Doyle in 1987. He got me to put my hands back in the middle of my body, so-called mid body hands. And uh, I've taught mid body hands to pretty much everybody since then. So it, it stood the test of time. What's another, somebody had, had a hand go up a second ago. Oh, okay. Karen and then Cheryl. Um, well, I think the grip is important. And I learned that from David Ledbetter, getting a little bit more in the fingers as opposed to that thumb, that, that thumb straight down, um, getting a little bit just um, so that V goes more to the right side of the ear so that you can just get the hinge naturally where people if that thumb goes straight down, then they're trying to hinge, but then they hinge their elbows instead. So I think the grip is, is important. And they're hand, making sure their right hand matches that left hand. Cheryl, you had a, a was that a Cheryl? Yeah, okay, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always taught the waggle, right? Because the waggle can teach you so many things or help you to feel so many things in your swing. And everybody has a different waggle. I remember Annika. So, so, so tell me this, Cheryl. So that's a great... A point you brought up. I'm a big waggle teacher. I don't teach it as much as I used to. 
Uh, don't really know why other than laziness. So I, I, I would like to know, why do you think it's sort of gone out of style? Like it was, everybody waggled when they played with Hickory. Everybody waggled in the 50s. Nicholas was not much of a hand waggler, but he had a waggle. Tiger, really not a waggler. Do you think that's, I mean, there's so many people copy Tiger. You don't really even see golf teachers talk about it much. They want to argue about everything else. Why do you think the waggle is sort of like, uh, Hogan devoted a whole chapter to it. I guess I haven't noticed that people aren't doing the waggle that much, but they're doing something because you can't something. Yeah. The swing, <laughs> right from a skill position, whether they're kicking their knee in or I remember Annika would like pump the club. There's, so there's some kind of movement, but uh, especially for a newer golfer, I like teaching them the waggle to give them the sense of rhythm. It helps them to with, even get their footwork go in the opposite direction of the waggle. So I think it just gets them off to a good start. Great. Anyone, anyone else have, have, have one there? Uh, let's go Pia and then Krista and then Sarah. And then we'll go to the next question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pia. Well, for me, it would be very basic and it's always been with what I'm doing, we're doing, it's, it's to have a sense of balance in your body and it never goes out of style. And so it's so simple, but so many still swing with the high center of gravity. And it just, so just the sense, sense of balance that you actually can feel that low center of gravity to the finish. I've never ever seen anyone not improving by focusing on that. And it's going it's to it's be important even 100 years from today. <laughs> which one of your favorite drills for, for getting someone to feel that, that, that they've shifted their uh, balance it's way, low. It, it's more it's not just how you want the weight shift it's just the physical ability to sense balance so depending on their skill level some can only do feet together and finish in balance and if they're more advanced is you know being checking on right and left foot can they swing on one foot and finish in balance and if you get better than that you can be on balance ball, balls and finish in balance so they're closing your eyes. So there are many stages of how good you're going to be at balance, but any golfer improves by having a good sense of balance in their body and from there move on to other things. Great. Krista? Um, try two, two little things. One, a body, an arms and body connection. Um, going back, you know, Kelly and I were with Mike Adams in the early days, you know, eons ago. And so many valuable nuggets I kind of took from him that I still use to this day. And even I remember watching a Ledbetter video, you know, just the arm to chest connection. Mike took another step with customizing it based on the thickness of the chest. Now soon that left arm runs into the chest. Teaching a lot of women, I always felt like that was important to kind of sync up their arms and their body and take out some of the slack out of their swing, especially for those that were more flexible. Um, and then compensations for the larger chested men and women that need to get everything turning kind of more together. Um, so I think that's always been with me and just always seeing that and how that sinks into their, their rhythm and their timing and their sequencing. Also kind of customizing their grip, their left hand grip and just how their arms hang down naturally from their side and how much rotation is on their left hand. And, you know, knowing that that impact the shoulder, elbow and wrist joint always seek alignment. So some people just have more internal rotation and will have a stronger grip, some a little more neutral. And so allowing people again to swing within the way that they're, that they're built and they're designed to be more injury free and to be more efficient. Cool. Sarah. Simple. So I have two. One is um, to hit the ground where the ball is. That's like pretty, pretty. Bad. <laughs> I, mean, I teach I've never not taught somebody that and then my second thing would be the waggle also to, to touch off of what Cheryl was saying I think it's coming back because of um swing catalysts like we're seeing movement creates movement and you can prove it now and we did see a lot of static people and I agree with you Brian I think it had a lot to do with what Tiger was doing now we're seeing it move back towards let's create if you don't do something downstairs you're gonna have to be basically a Pilates wizard to take that right, that <laughs> right? Okay, so we go we go back to the top again here with that with Allison. Uh, Allison, uh, what do you think of the the internet's influence on our business? I mean, it didn't exist until about two thousand and one, and now I, you you could make the point that it's the primary way people 
find out about all of us, the primary way they get an idea to go try on the driving range, uh, go, go to a golf school like, like uh, Vision 54. They, they hear about it on the internet. So it's, it's got a huge influence, obviously, like anything, right? I don't care what it is. I've got a lot of toys in here. There's good and bad. What do you think about the internet's influence on the business? I actually think it's been helpful for the business. I think from a marketing standpoint, it's tremendously easier for an instructor to be able to market themselves and help grow the game. I think that from an educational standpoint, we have extreme access to education at our fingertips. I think students are getting exposed to golf who may not have otherwise been exposed to golf without the invention of the internet. They'd have to be either introduced by a person or brought to a golf course. Now you might have a young person who's just coming across on YouTube, sees a really cool golf video, and now they want to be a part of the game. So I think that the internet has actually been quite helpful. Now, from a student's learning standpoint, of course, there's some pitfalls with, is the information appropriate for them? I think all, all of us on this panel would agree that we have students who have come and said, hey, I saw this tip. And then as a coach, we kind of have to decipher whether that's a good fit for them and their body style. And, and their swing shape or um, whether they need to go in a different direction. Um, I personally am a big fan of the evolution of our culture. And I think the internet has evolved our culture and it's made things more accessible to our golfing community. Give, give me one, one quick negative of the internet era of golf instruction. Yeah, the quick negative is, is how can someone determine whether it's right or wrong? Um, I think when we look at uh, research, we look at peer reviews, and if it's been peer reviewed enough times, then we can start to say, hey, this is something that is a standard for us. But when someone puts out content, how can a, an individual, a golfer, determine whether it's right or wrong, um, whether it's science-based, opinion-based, preference-based, or historical-based? Gotcha. Anybody else got a, want to weigh in on our, on our uh, Al Gore's big invention, Natalie? That's a joke. Uh, <laughs> he, he claimed to invent the internet. So. Um, I absolutely agree. And I always tell people that I think that, you know, all of this information that's online will never replace an in-person lesson because ultimately most people don't understand what they're actually doing. Um, and that's why they come see all of us. So we have to help them understand what, what the problem is and then they can maybe go on and look at some of these things. Um, but the other thing I think that's really great is it is a marketing tool and it gives people an opportunity to maybe get a little taste of your teaching style and how you talk um, before they come and see you. Because I do think that the communication piece is so important in connecting with a student because sometimes I watched a couple, I watched a couple of your videos this morning. So <laughs> work, see. Yeah. So I do think that that's nice, especially if you're, you know, moving to a new club, you go to a new you move for some reason, it's, it's a great way for people to be able to get a taste of who you are before they come and see you. Anybody got anything else on the, uh, on the old internet, uh, Christina, and then Lynn? I think the internet, the internet's phenomenal. I think it gives players a lot of hope. It gets them excited about their game. The only little negative I'd say is that if they are not working with a golf professional, it's really easy to misdiagnose what you're doing. You know, because there's so much information out there and you think you're doing one thing, but it's actually not even close. <laughs> so it's hard trying to fix it. Yes, Lynn, please. Yes, Lynn. The misdiagnosis and that most of those swings we're seeing on the internet are out of context. They're not, yeah. on, they're not on a golf course. Because a, what, a, what a golfer does in a studio or in their living room has nothing to do with context. So we need more, if, I think if we could take the internet and bring it out to the golf course, we have something there. So actually one of our coaches did nine holes on course playing lesson with FaceTime last week. <laughs> it's pretty cool. But on the well, golf course. Just, just to totally agree with you. So I had, a, a, and I've done this maybe five times. I've had TrackMan for 10 years. And I've given every golf lesson except for maybe 20 in 10 years with the thing just sitting there doing this deal. I might have not paid any attention or said anything to the student at all. But I've taken it on a golf course twice in the last year. And the two things that I, I figured out was everybody 
that, I mean, that, you, you know, can play a little bit of golf, swings a ton faster on the golf course, include me. <laughs> so, I mean, like you're, you're trying to evaluate somebody's golf game on the driving range and it looks real smooth. And then they go out on a golf course, they swing four or five miles an hour fast as a bunch. And uh, I, if anybody's got a, 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 a device that they can, that they can take out and just measure something, much less something that measures the, all the club delivery, I think you'd be very surprised. And, and Lynn, I, I, I pride myself on this, being able to remember the, uh, the person who said this, but I'm pretty sure it was Dave Phillips, and I love giving credit where credit's due. And he says, yeah, you know, all those swing sequences you see in the magazines, those guys and gals, they all knew that was going to be a swing sequence, see? And that's not real, see? I want to get it in the last hole of the tournament when they've got to knock it on the green like Hogan did, right? That picture, that's real. <laughs> that's real. So that's a very, a very good point. Okay, so um, Cheryl, coaching programs, pay as you go. Which one do you do or both? And and uh, what do you what do you think about that? There's a, I mean, you know, every every year, you know, around uh, show time, right? Where there's so many seminars, the week of the show, it's great. It's sort of become a teacher's convention now. I don't even hardly even get to see it. I walk, I make myself walk the show once. But, um, and, it, and there's seminars on, on turning your whole business into coaching programs instead of, uh, you know, pay-as-you-go lessons. What's, uh, what's your take on that uh, nice subject? Well, I, I am a big coaching program person. I've learned a lot from Rick Jensen and Henry Brunton. And so I would say 80% of my clients are on some kind of large package. 20%. Well, give me, give me an example. I mean, uh, money, I'm just saying a 10 lesson package a monthly. Minimum, my minimum is a 10 lesson pack and my junior programs are seven months long. So anybody that's a serious, junior golfer they're in a program from november through may with me i also do i also do um if people want a private one hour lesson i will do that for them the price is higher and i also do, i also do clinics you know i know people don't have that much money to invest so we do after school clinics for those kind of individuals or we do the lpga 101 program so it's a $200 class for six weeks or a get golf ready class. So it's yeah. so hard to teach people in one lesson. So, you know, we have different price structures and whatever fits their budget, you know, that's who just to show of hands, how many people are coaching program monthly coaching programs only. Ooh, see nobody. Okay. So, but how many people, it's more than 50% of your business. Somebody's on a monthly coaching program. Okay. Decent, decent amount. Anybody want to, want to weigh in on the, the hourly lesson versus um, uh, the coaching program? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, Susie. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, I think what's exciting about this conversation, and it's something that I think, I hope a lot of coaches are actually watching. So the PGA of America has partnered with Will, Rob Will Robbins Golf. And I'm sure many of you have, have seen or heard Will at a summit um, to offer the opportunity to understand coaching programs. I think when you ask all of us, perhaps we know what that is. Um, you know, and, and it's very hard, I think, as a young professional to understand that you can make more money work less hours uh, by teaching groups of people at a lower rate across the board where it's just a subscription service. But more importantly than that, I think a coaching program where I am currently, um, we really don't have the ability to develop one. Uh, we have a very small junior base and that's disappointing. We're trying to grow that extensively and we're trying to grow kind of our boot camp series into coaching programs. But in general, as I talk to professionals across the country, whether they're PGA or LPGA, what's happening in these coaching programs is they're building this unbelievable rapport. So instead of just having a client, right, or a consumer that you have this transactional relationship with, you're actually building this partnership. So it's far beyond a client. It's this repetition of 
I know you're there for me. Even if I can't make it this week, I know I have my appointment with you next week. I build this group of people I can play golf with. And what we're finding, it's creating an enormous amount of revenue for the facility and the coach. Um, but it's also developing relationships for on course where people can go out and enjoy each other's time together or the coach can take them out on course. So Lynn and Pia's point from the very beginning, we need this to be 50-50 when it's available. Uh, you know, many places you can't get people out on the golf course. Uh, I'm at one of those where it's just packed all day, every day until summertime. And But then in summertime, we can certainly have the opportunity to bring them on course. But I think if you're not looking at coaching programming and your facility would be adaptable to that, it absolutely, in my opinion, is the way to go, which is why we're directing our National Teaching and Coaching Committee. Trillium's the chair of that for me, which is amazing. Um, we have amazing minds on that committee, but really trying to drive this point home that it doesn't have to be this transactional 30 minute, great to see you, and then they're gone, right? Um, without any follow-up, without any retention. I think for us, it's all about retention. It's all about how do we keep that consumer wanting to be with us. And, and that happens locally, that doesn't happen nationally. So coaching well, programs, all for, even though I didn't raise my hand for the 100%, I think it's the well, way. Fun. Anybody else on, on the, the, anybody here don't have monthly programs at all, don't offer monthly. I'm a, I'm a by the hour guy. I like getting paid right away. I just like, I just I, I teach so many people that come in that not 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 right now now we're in this little semi lockdown but like so many people are out of towners you know and it's tough to but I do have a subscription show you know that I do so I understand the model right okay um, Cheryl this is a great one it's just I love how these they just come up perfect for the right people what would you do Cheryl to make instruction better on tv you're the boss new network wow i think all the, instruction i think the people that do it now are doing really well at it like michael breed that energy he gets people he doesn't have a, he doesn't have, he, i mean does he have a show anymore i mean i'm He's just saying work for cbs cbs Okay, but I'm just saying, what what would you do? Oh, no, no, I'm saying, yeah, Martin Hall, a great friend of mine, that's a great, I'm just saying, you're the boss now, you can do whatever you want. What would you do to, to, to move it up a notch? We wanna keep the people that are good and, and, and what maybe we offer some coaching, you know, of uh, how to play on the course, or what, what would you, God. live lessons, what, do you have any ideas? Everything. I think they have everything covered. I honestly can't think of anything. The only thing I wish they would bring back is that old show with Peter Kessler where he had a different um, coach on every week, right? Or a celebrity on. It. Yes. I love that. Okay, any, any ideas for making golf instruction on TV better, Allison, first? Yeah, I think, um, and I'm going to modify this quote from Susie, but I think that um, I would like to see the instructors on TV be representative of our neighborhoods. And so to be more diverse in the type of instructors that are out there. And I know that when you're on TV, it's a very, it's a top 1% type deal. Um, but to have someone sitting at home and say, oh, that person looks like me, I want to play golf, or I can resonate with that coach because I see myself in them. Um, I would love to see that, and I think that would enhance instruction. Cool. Christina? To actually have real people on the show, like a student, come on to the show as... Live lesson. A live lesson. I think that'd be phenomenal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Karen? Yes, maybe something a little bit more interactive. You know, get up off of the chair, and here's an exercise that you can actually do right then and there instead of just having people sit and watch them do it, get up and do it with them. I like that, Carol. I think Kelly. There should be, I think there should be a reality TV show on a country club. That would be hilarious. <laughs> yes, it would be. <laughs> I, can, I can think of a couple places, Kelly. How would you make golf on TV better? Golf instruction, sorry. We, we could do the other thing too, but. 
Yeah, the other <laughs> one sounds a little dangerous to me, but I like Allison's point about the really relatable people. Golf Magazine actually did a study what people wanted, and they basically said they want people that they can relate to. So I think different golfers getting instruction, and I like the idea of following them over time because one lesson doesn't really tell the story, but maybe get a group of like six or seven very different people and carry them through like a month of golf instruction and see what, how much work it takes, you know, how the adjustments are made, whether it's full swing adjustments, short game, on course. So people could really see the progression, but also people that they can relate to, you know, that idea where that person kind of reminds me of me so that they could see it's not that easy and it does take time and commitment and a great instructor. Dana, you had any, I want, I want, I want to hear a lot of people on this because I, in my opinion, it's, it could be a lot better. If you had the opportunity, if the, if the hole was there, right? Somebody said, we're going to devote a network to golf improvement, but you've been doing this a long time, Dana, you know, surely oh. you've seen all these shows come and go. I haven't been on a few of them, but. I, I think I think what's really missing on TV is the true understanding of learning and progression and skill based learning. Um, it seems to still be too tip based. And so a tip means I'm going to try it. It doesn't mean I'm going to ingrain it. And I, I, I really have been um, focused on my teaching to make sure that I stay on a solid progression. And I think in TV, we need to have something laid out where students understand where the start base is. And that this is not, if they don't even know when they're talking about coming over the top, they don't even know quite honestly if they're even doing that. So they don't know what really applies to them. And that's, that's where I think uh, TV instruction um, is, or, or even uh, you know, YouTube or any of it, uh, is, is a little bit difficult for people who are tuning into that. So if I was doing a TV show, I would say if you're this handicapper, um, this, is the, this is the type of progression you need to be going in. These are the skills you need to be learning. Uh, many times uh, players work on full swing a, a, as a new golfer all into uh, mid handicappers and never really address how to hit short game shots until they start playing better and they realize they can't get it on the green from 50 yards and in. And so I, I think it's important that there's a progression that's laid out for golfers to, to ascribe to and go to. Susie. Yeah, so just to follow up on what Dana said, um, you know, I've always wanted the world, <laughs> literally, whether it be on TV or in print, to follow the ski model, right, which is green, blue, black, and double black. And I think what's missing in all instruction is what Dana just said, this skill progression this opportunity to think if you're sitting on your couch at home and you consider yourself a new golfer. I would tell you that many, many of the people I teach that call themselves new golfers are not new golfers. They are golfers who have played 200 rounds of golf in their lifetime, but they think I asked them if they were a good golfer, which that's not what we asked. We asked, are you a new golfer, right? So we first have to make a descriptor of what that was for green, what that is for blue, black, black especially for people who didn't ski but for people who ski like and what does that mean so okay if you're a green circle you get five clubs right these are the five you're going to use and so you meet xyz skill progression in every facet of the game once you get there we're going to add two more clubs in and you can choose to stay green and play four holes the rest of your life and we're going to welcome you just like skiing or if you would like to be blue, we're gonna bring you as PGA and LPGA professionals and coaches to the blue zone, right? And we're gonna have you ski a little blue, we're gonna have you ski a little green, we're gonna give you some joyful mindset, some strategy on course, some ability, with a few extra choices thrown in if you so choose to use them. Once you hit all those skill progressions on course, to your point, Brian, right? Where it's not just we're watching you on a flat lie on a driving range, once we get 
Then we're going to throw in a couple more clubs and then you could choose to use those or not. You could choose to still ski green with your family and your friends, play a scramble in a corporate event. You could choose to go to the black. Why what's, we don't the, what's the three colors in skiing? What are they? What, what, are, they, what are they? I mean, I've green, done blue, green, blue, black. Right. There's, so, the name of the show. There's your show. Green, blue, blue, black. How to go from green to blue to black. Right. That, that could be a show right there. Right. Yeah. And excitingly, we're coming out with a coaching channel. Unfortunately, COVID got in the way. Um, and my hope is to have PGA professionals from all over the country, as well as PGA professionals all over the world, um, highlighted. And, and if we could follow some model that the audience is actually the benefactor, right? Absolutely. Not um, and, and I agree with Cheryl. I, I think the people on TV do a tremendous job for the circumstance they're in and the time period they have to deliver to a vast audience of millions. I mean, it's, it's far harder than they make it look. Um, but, you know, we have room for growth in all these areas, but we have to think of the consumer mindset, uh, not as us as expert player mindset, right? And when we go there, we will deliver a product that is vastly greater and more improved. Awesome. Deb, if there was a Deb Vangelo show, what would it be? Well, I think everybody's kind of hit on the components that I would want to see, but, you know, just basic instruction and building of skill to the next skill. And I think that would really, really resonate with a lot of people. And then they would just keep going forward. But I think we put the hit excuse me, we put the end too much at the beginning. And we, we teach in language that they don't understand and people are afraid to admit it, but because they think they're supposed to know that. And I think if we started a lot more simpler and just kept building, we could see some really, really good value. So this, this sort of leads, uh, uh, Chris, I think you'll probably be able to get it in, into this one. So this sort of leads into, we got four minutes left into my final question, which this last question sort of, You get one wish to the golf genie. This it's not me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one wish that you think could make golf better through golf instruction. Okay. We you can't say everybody gets a perfectly set fit set of clubs that, that would probably help. I've seen some pretty bad clubs come for two hundred dollar an hour lessons. But uh, uh, what we're gonna do? We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna start with Allison and we're gonna go right down to Allison, Cheryl, Carol, like that. Just try to make it quick. We got three more minutes. One thing that you could do, I'll, I'll go first. So just to show you how you, I, even somebody that talks as much as me can get it out quick. Here it is. I think everybody who belongs to the PGA or the LPGA should have to post one full live lesson a year they can pick it if they want and put it up on the internet just to keep your certification. Allison, what's your one wish? Okay, so I'm not sure I understand the question. The one wish for you get one, you, you get one thing. You get you, uh, everybody has to take a putting lesson next year. Every every golf teacher has to learn yeah. the learning model. Get one one wish to improve golf yeah. through golf instruction. Golf through golf. I think my one wish is everybody needs to see a golf therapist at least one session. Men mental game therapist. Yes. Yes. Okay. Cheryl? I think every instructor should find a way to do a LPGA girls golf program and also take the PGA coach uh, program. That was excellent. Great. Carol? I think that teachers and coaches need to give 75% more playing lessons whenever they can, early in the morning on the back nine or late in the afternoon before they go home. Great answer, Christina. I think it would be great if we were had to shadow another instructor for six months so we could learn something that we don't know. I second, the, I second that nomination. <laughs> I second that. That's a great one. Dana. I think every every teacher should make their players better faster that's the real answer karen um yes i i think um you know every teacher should really take their student through uh, at least some sort of basic golf fitness screen 
to make sure they know what capabilities their student has before they try to make them do something. Great, Kelly. Uh, Brian, I'd like to see a full list of cause and effect that we could share amongst instructors. So in other words, if I turn my hand this way, the ball would do this. The big book of cause and yeah, effect. Yeah, but that's okay. Yeah. yeah, that way instructors are making the wrong diagnosis and making students worse. So I think it'd be very yeah. easy to do a full list of cause and effect and share it. I'll, I'll contribute a page, Sarah Stone, and a PhD. Uh -huh. I'm going to go with, I think, teachers need to spend more time with the people they disagree with that are coaching and understand why. Gold star. <laughs> yeah. Man, gold star. I, I was going to be something I was going to, that was a question I didn't get to. Natalie, the one, one, one wish. Um, I think it would be awesome if new golfers started playing from 25 yards and progressed backwards, kind of like what we were talking about before, which is sort of what Will, Will Robbins' program is. Um, they get better faster. Cool. Trill, you know. Well, I was going to say we should have everyone watch five instructors, Christina Ricci and then uh, Sarah built on it. But at my next one, maybe this was my first one, is have a cent PGA or LPGA have a centralized library with a peer review journal. So anybody who's got some great, brilliant ideas, let's put it all together in one place and we can have some outsiders kind of look at, I won't say referee, but you know, let's put it in there, have it synthesized. So everybody has access to it. If you're a coach, everybody can figure out where it is and it's, and everyone's on an even playing field. Cool. Cool. Lynn. Get them on the golf course. You just need to coach on the golf course. Is that so they play the game and yep. that's where all the variability is. And so coach them on the golf course. Yeah. Well, I would follow up that every, all the teachers need to observe golfers. They don't even have to coach. Observe golfers on the golf course and see things beyond technique that still influence the technique. So can you go out and watch and pick up on things that are pure technical, but really influence the technique? Krista? Um, take a lesson in something that you're not proficient in. The field kind of put yourself in the student's shoes a little bit. And then I got two seconds on the uh, on the reality show on the TV. I'd like to see a teach off teachers versus yeah. teachers and the students and maybe of a team of teachers against another team of teachers and who can get their group of students improved the fastest, whether you do it with mental stuff on the course technique, however you want to do it and have like, like a competitive teach off. Sign me up, Susie. <laughs> one wish, yeah. one wish. I wish every teacher would understand why the person standing in front of them has chosen to spend their time with you and then deliver it. Awesome. Deb, perfect person to, uh, you know, for the that, was, that was just a good one to end on. That is exactly what I would say too. And I think I've evolved into being a different kind of teacher when I go there now. I don't think I did that at the beginning of my career. So kudos to that. Well, ladies, I, I just want to tell you that I, I, I had a blast talking golf with all of you and, and hope that uh, my only hope for this is that the teachers who saw it, and I'm sure there were plenty, look you folks up and, uh, and, and, and start trying to uh, have your mentor you know, there. Uh, there's a little bit in every one of you that everybody could learn from. And uh, hopefully the golfers out there now know how smart all you folks are, and I, I did ahead of time. So thanks so much, Allison, for putting the group together. And thank you so much for being on my show. I, 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 I'm, I'm sure everybody enjoyed it as much as I, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you. See you guys.